we do have this new Brazil, and it's an exciting time to like actually just like, see what we can do to launch a coffee, and how much hype can we throw behind a coffee. We're really excited about. Um, we'll also talk about like if you've ever seen our bean shells before. We have all these different colors here. We have these green coffees. We have these orange coffees. What does that mean? Uh, when you see two Brazils next to each other, one's a green one, one's an orange one. Why? That's that's gonna be a part of this. Okay. Hey, welcome. Um, and then also, if you see one coffee next to another and one costs more than another, why is that the case? And why why does that happen? And why does it matter? And why does it not matter? As far as the coffees that you like to drink. Um, so real quick, just kind of a talk about what's going on on the shelf when we see these different colors of different coffees. Uh, our orange coffees are our foundational coffees. And what that means is that we're always gonna have a coffee like that on the shelf in that category all the time. So if you come in, you like the Brazil Legender, you like that yellow label Brazil, um, and you come in a year from now, there will be a Brazil, If it, let's say it's not Legender, but it is gonna be a Brazil that tastes pretty much like the same kind of coffee you liked last year. Um, same with Colombia, Guatemala. They're going to be categories of coffee that you can rely on. When you like this, the Colombia Sinergas, that Colombia is going to be available. Uh, the green label coffees are our seasonal coffees, and those come and go all the time. So let's say uh, you like the Ethiopia Hembella. Um, we're not guaranteeing that that coffee will be here next week or next month. And if we do replace it with a similar or with another Ethiopia, it might not taste the same as Hambella. Um, so we taste those because we love the way they taste. We think they're worth bringing in. Um, they're usually more expensive coffees in green form. Uh, they're usually a lot more fruity. They're usually on the lighter roast spectrum. Um, and because we're buying them as fresh as we possibly can, we're buying them for flavors that really stand out and pop. Those tend to be more expensive coffees. And if you like that kind of thing, uh, we're going to talk today about why those are more expensive. So it has a fruity flavor versus a chocolatey flavor. Why is a fruity coffee more expensive than a, a chocolatey coffee? That's what today's talk is going to be about. Uh, quick aside, we also have a white label there. Uh, that is the seasonal blend. We just started doing that last year. We absolutely love it. Um, it's just kind of an excuse to play with some coffees that we have on the shelf and make blends ourselves that we really enjoy. Uh, so the spring blend, Bloom, is going to be you know, heading out as spring heads out. That's 75% uh, Ethiopia Hembella, 25% Peru. We'll usually just take two seasonal coffees on the shelf and blend them together in a way that we think is awesome. Uh, so spring blend is like light and like springy, right? Light and fluffy and airy. Uh, our summer blend is going to be like a fruit punch. It's going to be super rad, deeply fruity. Um, it's going to be the Ethiopia Hembella, right? And uh, Hembella Natural as well. We just bought a different process of the Ethiopia that we love. We're going to combine the two for our summer blend, which is rad. Um, so, any questions about what those colors mean on the, on the shelf? That's rad. The orange guys here all the time. They're, those are like your easy drinkers. Uh, someone who likes coffee, just wants a cup of joe, going to love those coffees. We have darker ones, lighter ones. But they're gonna be recognizable as coffee, whereas those green label ones, you might not even, like if you were to ice it, you might think it was a tea. It's like they're kind of crazy like that. Um, so the point of this event here is that we have this new Brazil we're really excited about. It is a green label Brazil, which means it's a seasonal Brazil, which means we don't have a ton of it. Uh, it means we were, we were tasting these coffees next to each other. We said, this Brazil tastes nuts. We have to bring this thing in. There's not a lot available. And it's a really cool opportunity to taste it next to the one that we have on the shelf all the time and talk about why this one costs more than that one. Um, to do that, we're going to score these coffees in kind of an objective way, the way that when we taste coffees for quality, how we decide what is a higher quality coffee than another, uh, we assign a score to it based on the flavors that we're tasting. Um, and the way you decide what a flavor is that gets a point versus what a flavor is that takes away a point is all traceable back to what happened on the farm that gave us these flavors. Um, so both of these coffees actually are really great coffees. I, when I was first kind of planning out this talk, I had this analogy of like, you're having two apple pies and one's made of like worm-eaten apples and one's made of like Whole Foods apples. And even though you might like the flavors and the wormy one, you have to admit that it came from things that aren't so great. That's actually not what we're talking about here. 
We're talking about two apple pies. One was made from like Whole Foods apples and one you went to Huber's and like picked your own and it was exactly the way you want it. So they're two very high quality coffees. Um, one just goes a little bit extra and every time you go a little bit extra, you pay for that. Uh, so the farmer had to pay more to get the flavors out of this coffee to make these happen, which means that when we buy that green coffee from them, uh, we pay more on our end to do that. Um, so let's break down each of these coffees. We have the um, Brazil Legender, which is our foundational coffee, our orange label coffee. Um, and we'll kind of break down some stats that make this coffee taste the way it tastes. Um, the, the first big one is that it's a natural processed coffee. Um, that means that after they pick the coffee off the, the coffee tree, they dry the coffee in its cherry form and don't take the fruit off of the coffee when they dry it. Um, what that means is that it tends to be a little bit sweeter. Uh, it's a little harder to control that process. So when you have an awesome tasting natural coffee, it represents sort of a risk that went in there because it's harder to quality control natural coffees dried in the fruit than it is to control wash pro uh, processed coffees where you take the fruit off of the seed before you dry it. So you can really see what's going on in that form and you have a chance to, to make that taste better along the way. Um, the other, our seasonal Brazil is called uh, Satillo Gran Nombre, by the way. And Satillo Gran Nombre is also a natural processed coffee. So they are actually equal as far as the type of process. They are the same kind of process there. Um, Brazil Legender was grown at 1,100 meters above sea level. And Satillo Gran Nombre was grown at 1,200 meters above sea level. What that means is that uh, Satillo Gran Nombre is a little bit higher up into the mountains. Uh, and what that means is that um, the changing in temperature between night and day is a little bit more intense. So they have colder nights, warmer days, uh, which means that the plants are kind of stressed out. At night, they have to think about you know, what they're going to do to stay alive and what they're going to do to preserve the fruit on the tree is pump more nutrients into each fruit the higher up you go. So that little elevation spike in the Satillo Granobre is going to give it a little more sweetness, a little more flavor that we really enjoy. Um, another huge contributor is the coffee varieties that are grown in each farm. Uh, so Brazil Legender is Mondo Novo and Yellow and Red Catuayi. Uh, and a good way to think about coffee varieties is like thinking about apple varieties. So you never go into like Whole Foods or Kroger and just say like, give me an apple and they hand you a nondescript apple and you take it away and you maybe like it, maybe you don't. You know exactly what apple you're going there for. You know why a Red Delicious tastes different than a Fuji, that's different than a Gala, and you know which one you want. Coffee is very much the same way. Uh, so Mondo Novo and Red and Yellow Katuayi, um, they are higher yielding plants. So they produce more fruit. Uh, they're a little more disease resistant, which means that they're more hardy. Um, but the trade-off between more fruit and more disease resistance is usually a, a slight decrease in, in like the sweetness and the fruity flavors that that coffee can give you. Um, whereas Satillo Gran Nombre is, uh, is yellow bourbon, which is a lower yielding plant uh, than Mondo Novo. Um, and what that means is that more nutrients can go into each fruit, making each fruit sweeter. And yellow bourbon is really known for its sweetness. That's really what it does the most. We're definitely going to taste that in this coffee. Um, and the, the other major contributor as to why these coffees are different is that Brazil Legender is dried on patios, which means that they form these kind of these shallow lines on these concrete patios and they rake them and they make sure they're drying evenly, but they are dried on the ground. Uh, and they don't dry quite as evenly because they're in these like piled rows as opposed to Satillo Gran Nombre which is dried in raised bed, kind of like mesh beds up off the ground. So air can get to all of them and they rake them and stir them all the time to make sure they're drying evenly. And that just makes a little more a controllable process and really makes the quality control easier uh, when you're drying up off the ground like that. Think about like, you know, what bugs can get into also. Things on the ground, you're just more susceptible to things like that. Things dried up onto raised beds, a little easier to control and keep clean and, and, and controlled. Um, so we can see that Brazil Legender is a great coffee, has a lot of things going for it. So Tio Granombre just does a little extra stuff to it uh, that's gonna let it edge out in some of these flavors that we really enjoy. We get these flavors because we can trace them back to these little differences between the two farms that make them, that, that makes the difference into why you might taste one thing in one coffee and different things in another. So everyone knows which coffee is which? Cool, does everyone have both coffees right now? 
If you don't have both, come and get some more. If you want to top off, please feel free. So this is Andy. Andy is our new shop ops operations manager. He's going to Vanna White this SCAA flavor wheel for us. Um, so first, let's score. Let's taste our Legender. I have it in my left hand for that reason. Um, so everyone get some good sniffs. Smell, smell, smell. Let's find some flavors on here that represent what we're smelling. Um, man, there's definitely some, I'd say malt in there. So malt we're gonna find here. I'm gonna be honest, allergies are killing me right now. So smells, I'm gonna be a little weak on. Um, what are you guys smelling in this guy? Anyone, shout something out. Or don't, that's fine as well. Brown sugar, awesome, love it. I totally agree, that's right on. I almost hy uh, abbreviated that, <laughs> which would not have been. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Let's everyone smell the Legender. Oh man. Oh yeah, not uh, smell the CTO now and taste and smell why they're different. So that guy, there's actually some like some low noted fruit in there, which I'm really interested in. Um, so I'm gonna say probably pear. It's kind of a soft. It's not very fruity, but it's mainly sweet, kind of pulpy smelling. I really like pear for that. And there's definitely something malty, grainy in this guy as well, right? Kind of in a cereal area. Um, so let's say, let's call that maybe like hazelnut. Would anyone agree with that? It smells kind of hazelnutty and pear-y. Yeah? Cool. Flavors. Let's taste that Legender. Man, deep low notes right off the bat, right? Like not a bunch of high fruity stuff, but mainly like chocolatey, caramelly, nutty area, right? So let's definitely call that chocolate. And then... I like to imagine throwing these things into a blender and like what would it take to put in that thing to make it taste like what I'm tasting here. Everyone forgets that, that coffee is also an answer. Like, so it's like 90% coffee. Um, <clears throat> and then, man, I'm gonna throw some almonds in there for sure. I'm not getting a lot of fruit. Anyone tasting fruit in this guy? No, not me neither. Um, maybe some maple syrup or molasses as well. Let's go molasses. It's more like, yeah, clovey molasses, kind of harsher, not in a bad way, but kind of in a deep sweetness. And then go back to the Satillo Gran Nombre. That fruit comes out immediately. It's not like. Not very fruity, but there's definitely some acids happening here uh, in a way that's just not happening in the Legender. Um, so when you think acid, when you taste anything that's like a zing, think fruit immediately. Now you have to go to the fruit side and find that acid on here. Um, I'm going to say it's kind of like in the prune, raisin, cherry area. Again, it's lower. It's not citrus by any means. Um, what are you guys thinking? Blackberry, raspberry, blueberry, strawberry, raisin, prune, coconut, cherry, pomegranate, pineapple, grape, apple, peach, pear. Sour cherry. Cherry, I cherry. totally agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else? Little cherry. I think it's mainly like, mainly over here too though. I'm gonna say honey for sure. Um, caramelized flavors. Cool. So we're gonna let this cool even more before we get into like the, uh, the body and the finish. But let's talk about scoring and the kinds of things we would uh, give or take away points for. 
we're not going to be taking away many points, if any, to either of these colleges because they're both baller, right? Um, but acidity, we did not taste much acidity in the Legender at all. We didn't taste none, but not much. So I'm going to give that a 0.5 on acidity. We'll give a tick mark there. Um, whereas the CTO Granombre, Nombre? It's Portuguese. I don't, you know, well, I'm going to say Nombre, and it's wrong, but that's all my dumb American mouth can do. Um, acidity, we tasted some, not a ton. But let's give that a 1.5. Um, not like the most, but a little bit. Now, sweetness is where I love this coffee so much. Um, when we tasted this coffee on the cupping table, we were like tasting, it's actually this, uh, the importers, Cafe Imports, they had this huge auction uh, in Brazil and the winners of the auction, they put into this awesome like package to send to roasters, to taste like the top lot auction lots from this Brazil auction they had. Uh, and this was in there. Um, and we were tasting them all like this is like one of the sweetest coffees I've ever had without being intensely fruity also. Um, so sweetness, like I'm going to give this guy like a three, which believe it or not, it's a crazy high score. We don't, we only have five and surely there are sweeter coffees in the world. We have to imagine. So three here, um, sweetness with the legendary. I'm going to give it a one, uh, it's, it's kind of sweet, but it's also, it's not nearly as sweet as the, uh, Satio Gran Ombre. Um, complexity is where we can talk about how to score individual flavors. Um, so things like malt, uh, molasses, these are kind of lower. It's kind of dry a little bit. Um, it's got some like, not ashy, but more earthy tones. So I'm gonna give it a 0.5 negative for complexity because it's kind of, it's a little dirty tasting. I like that in this coffee. But objectively, you're going to say it's because of some of the, the lesser like farm practices we talked about where we get that flavor. And that's why that's not in the other one. So I take away a little bit there and we're going to give it, let's give it a two on complexity up here because like brown sugar is awesome. Almonds are great. Chocolate's amazing. Who doesn't love some molasses, you know? Um, so Tio Gran Ombre. Oh man, yeah. I'm gonna give this guy a 2.5, just cause those flavors are like so baller and I'm not gonna take anything away on complexity. Because this is one of those like very sweet coffees, some really good basic flavors with almost zero distractions on the negative side. I'm not tasting this thinking like, man, I wish it was more X. I'm just thinking like, this is, just, you know, why? This is just positive stuff, which I'm really into. So let's get into aftertaste and body with these guys. Um, the Legender is a little bit drier. So if you rub your tongue against the roof of your mouth after you taste this, it sticks a little bit. And if you exhale out your nose really slowly, you'll smell some like woody, papery straw kind of smells. Um, it's also very sweet at the end. So it leaves my mouth super sweet. It's a little bit dry. It smells a little bit papery. So I'm going to say, uh, sweet, dry there. And then the Satillo Gran Ombre, not as dry on my tongue when I do this. Uh, when I exhale, I, that, I get that pear again. That aroma comes back really like nice nose and like maybe even sweeter. Um, so I'm gonna say sweet and pear. Um, like the ripest pear ever. Like there's really not a lot of acidity in this guy at all. Um, so for aftertaste, notice that like there's a lot more negatives on aftertaste than there are positives. Uh, aftertaste is where like coffees usually fall apart if they're gonna. Um, so aftertaste with a, tea, with a Legender, I'm gonna give it a minus 0.5, but also a plus 0.5. Um, because I think that there's a lot, actually I'm gonna give it a plus one. That sweetness is really rare and like really, really nice. Um, so plus one on the aftertaste. 
Whereas with this guy, I'm going to give this a plus one, but I'm not going to take away anything uh, because it's just pleasant. Really, really nice. That dryness isn't there. Sweet, pear. Um, again, also coffee, you guys. Like, I'm, I'm, This isn't like this big obvious thing necessarily. It's like it tastes like coffee and then also has these notes. Kind of like wine tastes like wine and then also has the stuff that's on the bottle, right? Um, so overall is where we get to be a little more subjective. Um, so I, I like to use the overall category here as like a what did I do over here. To me, it's kind of an amalgamation. Uh, but also, if there was something that I really liked about this coffee that wasn't reflected in any other category, I could, I could give that there. Um, so for me overall, like this coffee like freaks me out so much and I love it in my heart, like in a deep satisfying sort of way, like a, like a blanket or a mother's hug, you know? Um, so overall, I'm gonna give this guy a two and a half, which if you look might be a little high compared to some of these ones and one and a halfs, but I love it so much. So for me overall, pretty high scoring coffee here. Again, I'm not taking away anything from this coffee. Um, overall here, there were some flavors I didn't like. So I'm gonna go 0.5 over here. And overall, like for me, as far as actual like quality in a coffee goes, things we wanna pay extra money for, uh, overall I'm gonna give it a 1.5. So we're gonna add all this together. By the way, these numbers, how much to add to which just comes with doing it a lot and tasting a lot of coffees. So like, I, don't, I wouldn't expect anyone to know like what the difference between a one and a one and a half is on sweetness like within a year of cupping. It's just super hard and I'm not great at it either. Uh, so don't like, this is just like how we do what we're thinking about. We've tasted a lot of really terrible coffees. We've tasted a lot of really awesome coffees and this is kind of where this one falls in the spectrum. Um, so let's add these up. We have, I like to do the negatives first. So we have negative one, one and a half. So minus 1.5. Uh, and then plus two, three, uh, three, that's going to make it five and a half. 5.5. 5. Two, three, four. Nope. <laughs> this is awful. Okay, three, four. Cool, that's going to be six. Great, love it. Uh, which gives us a final score of 84 and a half. Uh, and then here, let's see if I can do math again. Sorry, guys. Uh, there's going to be four, seven, eight, nine and a half. This is going to be 89 and a half. Which, if we look up here, uh, it is like on the verge of being excellent. Uh, it really is an excellent coffee. We really do love it a lot. But as far as like actual quality scores, though, coffees that go into the 90s, up into the 95s, are like tons of fruit, tons of sweetness. Notice how like the acidity category was like 1.5 on this. Uh, there are coffees that get up into the fours and fives in all of these categories. Um, Ethiopia Hambella is a great example of a coffee that like technically on the quality side of things maxes out some of these categories in a ridiculous way. So we love Satio Granombre. So this is one of my favorite coffees ever. Like Satio Granombre is like I will drink as long as we have it and drink way too much of it all the time. Um, you might like Legender more than Satio Gran Ombre, and that is totally fine. The analogy I like to give to this is that we know what happened at the farms. As a result of those practices, we give them these scores based on these flavors. And then you get to pick in the morning when you're waking up which one you feel like drinking. Maybe you don't want a super fruity coffee earlier in the day. Maybe you want something more chocolatey, nutty, more approachable. Um, and this is the analogy that I have in my head all the time, is that we all live in Kentucky, right? We all drink bourbon. We're all borderline alcoholics. Um, so like if you go on the Buffalo Trace tour, and I, which I highly recommend, uh, they'll tell you how Pappy Van Winkle is made, right? And it was just, it's made in that facility. It's made in the same Rick houses as some of these other bourbons. And like the story is really romantic. It's really awesome. We can break it down just like we did these two copies actually. So like, Buffalo Trace is like age five to seven years, oak barrels, different mash bill has a different percentage of like rye, wheat, and corn. Um, Pappy Van Winkle, everyone loves, everyone freaks out about. Pappy Van Winkle 23 year is like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, and what makes it so expensive is that like 
it sits in these rick houses for 23 years they're paying rent on these things right so like you could put out so many more barrels of another kind of bourbon in that spot that is sitting for 23 years every year it loses between uh 10 and 3 percent also which just evaporates um, out of the barrel. So you start with 53 gallons of Pappy Van Winkle, you end with 14 gallons of Pappy Van Winkle by the time they pop these casks, which just means like the amount you have to charge for how much you have left of this 23 year old bourbon is insane. Uh, every year it sits in these casks, in the winter it's working its way into the wood, in the summer it's working its way out of the wood and kind of going back and forth, giving it that like lovely woody flavor that if you're drinking a bourbon, you're gonna give tons of points to, right? We love this oak. We love all these ancient wood flavors that this has. And when I sat down and paid my $80 for my shot of Happy Venom Winkle 23, and I, I got to drink the nastiest thing <laughs> I've ever put in my mouth. I super cannot stand Happy Venom Winkle 23 year. Uh, even though it is technically probably the best bourbon I've ever had. And I have to recognize that. It's like this bourbon has gone through so much to get here. And people who know and love bourbon value this so highly that they will pay whatever it takes to get it. But I like Buffalo Trace. <laughs> and so whenever I'm gonna drink, whenever I'm gonna you know, drink a bourbon in a bar or buy a bourbon at the liquor store, I'm probably going to buy that one. And we'll probably never have Pappy again because it tastes like wood chips, super not into it. Anyone who has had it and loves it, you have it and love it because you like good bourbon. I like Buffalo Trace because I like fine bourbon. <laughs> which means that I get to pay less for the thing that I love. Um, and the thing that the, the lady giving the tour of Buffalo Trace said that I will carry with me forever and that I use in coffee talks all the time is that the best bourbon in the world is the one that's in your glass because that's the one that you picked because you like it. Uh, and the best coffee in the world is the one that you picked because you felt like having it that day because that's where your taste lead you. Um, there's no other reason in the world to drink coffee than because you love that coffee. Um, we do have our addictions, right? Caffeine is a stimulant. <laughs> uh, but like you start drinking coffee because you love it and you learn to like different flavors and coffees because you love those flavors. You do not need coffee. Uh, I shouldn't say that here, <laughs> but like none of us need this. We do it because we love it. So if you love Legender, ignore the fact that it's an 84.5 and Satio Gran Hombre is an 89.5. Just love the coffee that you love. But know that there's a reason that Citio Gran Hombre costs more than the Legender. Because every time something happens that's awesome at a coffee farm, whether it's a quality control step or it's more intense picking practices, uh, let's say I want my pickers on the farm to only pick a certain shade of cherry off the tree. That means they have to go back several more times as the coffee ripens to pick only that shade. Whereas if I'm not concerned about what really what shade of fruit they're picking, they can pick it all once. You only send them out once, that costs you less money, you're paying them less. Um, if you're gonna have someone sit there over a coffee bed and hand sort to make sure the color gradient is even tighter, you're paying someone to do that, which means that when a farmer pays more to have someone quality control their coffee, that means that they have to sell that coffee more to the exporter who buys it in the country. The exporter has to charge more for the importer who brings it into the US. The importer is gonna charge more to the roaster that buys it and roasts it, uh, which means that these green level coffees that have these higher scores, lots of fruit, lots of clean flavors, very sweet. Whether you like that or not, it does cost more to get those flavors in that coffee. Um, and for me, I mean, that's really unfortunate is that I love that. So like if I'm gonna go to a coffee shop, I'm spending more money for the coffee that I love. But I only drink coffee because I love that coffee, so it's worth it to me. Um, any questions about like why, why this stuff happens or any farm stuff or anything like that?